don't bother me. I want to just sit in my pew and nobody better be in my seat either because I sit, I sit in the third row on the end seat and everybody knows it and nobody better be in my seat. Come on, don't mess with me, I'm a Christian. ready for the word today <laughs> now you know you can laugh at me all you want to but every one of us has one of these hanging on our life just want to make sure everybody gets to see this every one of us I do believe especially in our Western culture has one of these hanging on our life we just don't realize it. But I think this is what God sees. Because He sees our attitude. Now, we always have one of these on our hotel door. That's okay. But what that means when that sign is on that door is stay out of here. Don't bother me. Don't knock on the door. Don't ring the doorbell. Don't make any noise. I don't want you in my space. It's one thing to have one on your hotel door. It's another thing entirely to have one on your life. We're teaching about others. Others being the opposite of self. <laughs> and how we really can't be selfish and be happy. And what joy you can really find. What inner spiritual satisfaction you can find. When you get these kinds of things off of your life. And you begin to make yourself available to God on a regular basis. Why don't you just try? I'm going to, I'm going to teach you a new way to pray. Why don't you just try now in the morning when you pray instead of, well, it's okay if you tell God what you need him to do for you. I, that's not a problem. He says, bring your petitions to me. But I'd like you to add something to it. And God, what can I do for you today? Will you start praying that every day? God, what can I do for you today? Because I'm sure there is something that God would love to use you for if you would just be open to letting him do it. So the title of my message today is simply, Don't Disturb Me. Luke 10, 33. Father, we thank you for the word today and we pray that it will make an impact in people's lives. I don't want them just to hear it. I want them to go out and do it. Amen. You know, there's several stories that Jesus tells in the Bible that are just phenomenal. And it seems like no matter how many times we read them, we can actually get a little bit more out of them each time. Starting in verse 27, actually in Luke 10, it says... Well, you know, some of the smart people were asking Jesus which of his commandments were important. <laughs> and he said, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Think about what that means. And you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And all three of those relationships are important. Your relationship with God, your relationship with yourself, and your relationship with your neighbor. When I say don't be selfish, I'm not talking about not loving yourself. I'm not talking about not valuing yourself and taking care of yourself. I'm just talking about not living for yourself, where we are the center of our whole universe and think that everybody else should look at us as the most important thing in their life too. And Jesus said to him, now you've answered correctly, now do this. <laughs> Now watch, this is so good. The guy said, I know, I know what you said. Here's the most important. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, okay, do it. And you will live and enjoy active, blessed, endless life in the kingdom of God. So he's saying, uh, if you need a life upgrade, <laughs> does anybody who feels like you need a life upgrade? It's like, you know, you just like, Whoa. I'd like to take this thing to the next level. Then he says, the way you're going to have that 
better life you're looking for is by loving God more than ever, knowing who you are in Christ and valuing yourself as a child of God. Get rid of all the silly insecurities and fears that you have about yourself. God knew all about you when he called you into relationship with him. He's not surprised by you. And learn how to love your neighbor. So determined to acquit himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> okay, well, God, I don't, I don't mind helping some people, but just who is it that you want me to help? So Jesus taking him up, it's almost like Jesus was saying, okay, you want to play mind games with me? Here we go. A certain man was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him of his clothes and belongings and beat him and left him there unconcerned. He was actually half dead. Now by coincidence, a certain priest, everybody say a religious man, was going down along that road and when he, when he saw the man, it wasn't that he didn't see the man, when he saw the man, He passed by on the other side. He saw the guy and crossed the street. So he didn't have to get too close to him to really see what was going on. And a Levite, say another religious man, <laughs> likewise came down to the place and saw him and he passed by on the other side of the street. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if they weren't going to church. Maybe that's why they were in such a hurry that, that day that they didn't actually have time to love anybody. They wanted to go to church and hear another sermon about it. Come on, you came. You might as well get this. It's so easy for us to come together and theorize about all this. It's easy to write a great worship song about loving people. There's all kinds of them out today. More songs being written about love than ever before. But if every person who is a Christian on this globe did just one act a day that would come under the category of washing feet, if everyone would get out in their little corner of the world, wherever they are, their neighborhood, their school, their place of business, their work, and actually go out like somebody who's employed by God. God, I'm on your staff. What can I do for you today? Show me, God, please show me somebody I can help today because I am not willing to go through this day and only live for myself. I cannot do that anymore. I absolutely cannot do that anymore. I would venture to say that the world would be so full of Christians that we would see such a radical shift in the morality and the power available to us. People who need Christ are not all going to be one watching a television program or coming to a church. Most of the people that need him are in your little corner of the world. So those two guys, we'll just say for the sake of saying it, they were on their way to church, didn't have any time to actually love anybody. But a certain Samaritan, who, who the priest and the Levite had a real attitude towards, by the way. <laughs> yeah. They're not holy like us. <laughs> he came down to that place and saw him. You know, I pray that you start noticing things, will you? <laughs> pray that we actually see what's going on around us. When the Bible says watch and pray, it doesn't mean watch and gossip, watch and criticize, <laughs> watch and judge. Oh, we've got a lot of watchers in the body of Christ, all right. But how about the watch and pray? And by the way, God told me about two years ago, 
Don't ever ask me to do something for somebody that you could easily do yourself and just don't want to. Oh, God, please help Sister Brown get that new mattress she needs. Why, you silly thing, go buy her one. What a novel idea. Never thought of that. <laughs> We're always praying for somebody else to do it. And you know what? Even if you can't do it by yourself, get a little aggressive and go find 10 other miserable Christians and help them get out of their misery. Give them something to do besides think about themselves all day. Man. But a certain Samaritan, as he traveled along, came down to where he was, and he saw him, and he was moved. Lord, we need to get moved. He was moved with pity and sympathy for him, and he went to him, and he dressed his wound, and he poured on them oil and wine, and then he sat him on his own horse. This was all hard work. Getting a grown man on a horse is hard work. And he brought him to an inn. And he stayed there and he took care of them. Now, I want to tell you that this Samaritan was also going somewhere. He wasn't just kind of lollygagging around that day looking for somebody laying in the ditch that he could give his money and time to. He was on his way somewhere, just like the priest and the Levite. But he saw something that they didn't see. He got the guy on his horse, he took him to an inn, he took some of his time. And then he obviously had to go on and do whatever it was that he was on his way to do. But he took out two days' wages, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, you take care of him. And I love this. He didn't even put any limits on it. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back to see how the guy's doing. <laughs> and, you know, we have our limits. It's like... We do this in church, and then every time we come to one of these kinds of meetings, we give $5 or $10 or whatever, because that's a, you know, kind of like a sideline thing. And <laughs> we do. We get in ruts in our thinking. And we need to be more open to God about what He wants us to do. And it's not, this is just so minorly about what you give in church. It's not really about that at all. It's about how you live your life. And I think the little giving that we do in church and the, the sermons we hear about it, it's only just God's just trying to get through to us how he wants us to live. Giving is so little about putting an offering in church. It's about how you live your life. Need to live to give. I love this whole story. It's one of my favorite, 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 favorite stories. Proverbs 16, 9 says that Man's mind plans his way, but God directs his steps. I saw a sign recently that said, man plans and God laughs. <laughs> and you know, I do believe that our steps are ordered by the Lord much more than what we realize they are. And I believe that many times when we think we're in the wrong place, God has indeed got us in the right place. What am I doing here? I can't believe this happened. How did this happen? Jesus understood the difference between divine interruptions and demonic interruptions. It seems like people bounce back and forth, not really ever understanding the balance. You don't want to interrupt me when I'm having my prayer time and my fellowship time with God in the morning, unless it's really important. Not that I would be mean, but I'm not interruptible at that time. Because I learned many years ago that if I did not have that time with God, I was not going to be very nice that day. And it's not really good if you're a preacher and you're not nice. <laughs> Amen. I need a lot of help. And I can't do it on my own. I know that every day I tell God, I know full well I'm nothing without you. Amen. And if you don't help me, if you don't strengthen me, I will not do anything right today. 
And I remember when I first started understanding I needed to spend that time with God, and my kids were all still at home, and they'd get upset. Can't you come out of that room in the morning? Can't you come down here and make our breakfast? I said, look, you're all teenagers. You can put cereal in a bowl and eat it. <laughs> if you were smart, you'd send me to my room. Your life is going to be better if I'm in here. <laughs> so that's one thing that you need to not allow people to interrupt. You need to have your time with God because you're not going to be good for anything else if you don't do that. But then the rest of the day, we need to be open to God. Have a plan and work your plan unless God interrupts your plan. And if He does interrupt your plan, whatever time you spend doing what He's asked you to do, He will redeem that time back to you and make something else easier or send somebody else along to help you with that. And there's so many ways that we can do this. My husband is absolutely wonderful at talking to people and showing an interest in them that perhaps a lot of other people wouldn't mess with at all. And I think that's part of the way we show hospitality to strangers and foreigners and maybe people who feel a little bit out of place. What would happen when you go to church if instead of heading for your three friends... What would happen if you said, God, show me somebody today that's new. Show me somebody that's lonely. Show me somebody that's hurting. And how about if you went and got them and asked them to go sit with you and your three friends? But see, we don't, you know, it's like, you yeah, know. I'm going to church. Don't bother me. I want to just sit in my pew and nobody better be in my seat either because I sit, I sit in the third row on the end seat and everybody knows it and nobody better be in my seat. Come on, don't mess with me. I'm a Christian. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, another wonderful scripture that I absolutely love, Acts 10, 38. It says, see how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. We all want the anointing, right? And I love this. See how God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with strength and ability and power and how he went about doing good. We all went about. Every day you... Go out of your house, and you have the ministry of winting about. <laughs> How many of you get that? You know, you, what'd you do yesterday? Well, I went to the grocery store, and I went to the cleaners, and I went to the shopping mall, and I went here, and I went there. Well, how many people did you touch? Or did you do your best to ignore all of them and not have to talk to any of them, and not even time to smile? And maybe you had this gigantic cart full of groceries and there was some little old lady that had two items and the thought tried to enter your mind to let her go in front of you, but no, you were in a hurry. And... But bless God, you got your bumper sticker and your cross around your neck and got your fish shown on your t-shirt that you got at your Joyce Meyer conference. Come on, you all know I'm telling the truth. Well, I didn't, you know, I got this stuff from my own life, so I'm not picking on anybody else. Jesus was interruptible. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8. I mean, it's amazing to me what all he did just while he was winting about. Matthew 8, a day in the life of Jesus, verse 1. <laughs> When Jesus came down from the mountain, please notice that he started on the mountain, spending his time with God. He didn't come down until he did that. <laughs> no winting about until you have time with God. <laughs> Great throngs followed him. And behold, a leper came up to him and prostrating himself, worshiped him and saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. And he reached out his hand and touched him and saying, I'm willing. 
I want everybody here to reach out your hands and say, I'm willing. Hmm. You saw him, Lord. Oh, you've had it now. It's too late. You can't take it back. God saw you. He's got one of those cameras, you know, like they have on traffic lights now. Oh, and now he's got, a, he's got them in church, and he's, he's got a picture of every time you say, I surrender all, I surrender all. <laughs> Here I am, God, use me, use me, use me. Amen, Sister Joyce, that's right. Love should be the number one thing. You got snapshots of all that. And then Jesus said, don't tell anybody about this. Go show yourself to the priest. Offer the offering that Moses told you to offer. Verse 5, and as he went to Capernaum, a centurion came up to him, begging him, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house, paralyzed and distressed with intense pain. And Jesus said, oh, no problem. I'll come. I'll come restore him. Well, I know what most of us would have said. Well, I, you know, be warm and be filled. I got somewhere to go. I'll put you on my prayer list, but. <laughs> hey, I'm going to say whatever I want to today because I'm leaving town at noon. <laughs> Verse 14 through 16, and when Jesus went into Peter's house, he saw. <laughs> Open your eyes and look at what's going on around you. He saw his mother-in-law lying ill with fever, and he touched her hand. The fever left her, and she got up, began to serve. When evening came, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he drove out the spirits with a word and restored to health all that were sick. And this just goes on and on and on and on and on. I've got verse after verse after verse. So Jesus was definitely interruptible. We certainly need to stay focused and know what God's called us to do and not let people just use us and interrupt us for silly stuff, but we need to be available to God. How many of you will pray every morning, God, what can I do for you today? Now, don't you do that unless you mean it, because he's going to give you something to do. I'm giving you a way to get over being a bored Christian. Same old, same old, go to church, go home, go to church, go home, do the seminar, buy the t-shirt, happy clappy to the music, go to church, go home, go to church, go home. And after a few years of that, you're like, <laughs> then you think you need a new church, so you go somewhere else, they tickle you for a while, <laughs> then that wears you out. I know, I've been there, done all that. Please don't misunderstand this, but I think sometimes we make too much out of church as a building we go to to put in our time with God. And the fact is we are the church and we should be living this life everywhere that we go. That's what we need, people to get out there and live the life everywhere they go. Do you have any idea how many people just the people in this room could touch? My goodness, it would be phenomenal. Well, if you've had a do not disturb sign on your life, I hope today's teaching has encouraged you to take it off and make yourself available to God for whatever he may need you to do. Acts 10, 38 once again says, See how God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with strength and ability and power and how he went about doing good. I absolutely love that. That's one of my favorite scriptures. It just seems so simple and so beautiful to think that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, just simply went about doing good. And you know what? That's something every one of us can do. You don't need any special training or any special skills. You can just simply make a decision. I'm going to be a blessing everywhere that I go.
Well, as you can see, I'm holding twins, and they are one month old, but they are severely malnourished. And actually, I've just been told that there's hope for them, but we have to be able to feed the mother so she can allow them to nurse as well as feed the babies. There were twins here yesterday, but one of them had all had, had uh, died because of malnourishment. But we can save these, and you're helping us do that. They are so sweet, but they are so tiny, so tiny. Thank you so much for helping us make a difference in the lives of these people here in Ethiopia. Elke gedachte roept emoties in ons op. Kan jij hier goed mee omgaan? Laat je niet leiden door jouw gevoelens. Joyce Meyer heeft daarover een boek geschreven, zodat jij de baas wordt over jouw emoties. Leven boven je gevoel. Bestel het boek Leven boven je gevoel nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.